Last month, Norbert Hofer of the Freedom Party of Austria came within 31,000 votes of becoming the first far-right head of state in Europe since the defeat of Nazi Germany in 1945. Far-right groups there have made significant gains in the last year. And here in the United States, far-right groups have reportedly grown since the 2008 election of President Obama. Here to help us better understand what is fueling this all is Christian Picciolini. He is a former neo-Nazi who went on to found the group Life After Hate. That aims to educate people about the dangers of violent extremism. Picciolini just recently returned from a trip to Europe where he was sponsored by the U.S. Embassy in Bratislava, Slovakia to give a series of talks about countering extremist violence. And Christian Picciolini, welcome to Chicago tonight. Uh, first of all, just uh, give uh, people just a, a 25 second summary of your own story. We did a full feature on you, but for folks who don't didn't see it sure from the time I was 14 years old in 1987 until I was 22 in 1995 I was a member of America's first neo-nazi skinhead gang which was founded right here in Chicago and uh, you had an epiphany what was the epiphany and what are you doing now there were several catalysts that helped me get out uh, mostly being that I received compassion from the people that I least deserved it from when I least deserved it so I decided uh, along with having the birth of my children and, and changing my, my view on life, that I wanted to help other people leave hate groups uh, successfully because there was no support program when I decided to leave. Well, let's talk about uh, your, your recent experience. You were sponsored by the U.S. Embassy in Bratislava, Slovakia, to come and give a series of talks. What do they want you to come and do? And uh, what, 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 what did you do? So Slovakia is experiencing uh, a far-right extremist problem. Uh, they elected uh, a former neo-Nazi who is still an open racist uh, to parliament. And I spoke uh, to high school students uh, at the National Uprising Museum about my story uh, and about extremism, and also spoke in the town of Banska Bistrica, where uh, this gentleman, Marian Kotleba, is from, who was elected to parliament, which is a hotbed for far-right extremism. And uh, what kinds of uh, reaction did you get from the students you spoke with? Very positive, actually, because uh, nobody has come out in Slovakia as a former extremist to be able to talk about their story uh, and share that with people. So the students were we're very uh, excited to hear the story. I got a lot of positive feedback afterwards and uh, I'm actually going to be helping uh, Slovakia set up an exit program for people who want to leave hate groups. I understand you also attended a conference in Turkey about countering extreme vi extremist violence. Uh, who was there and what did you learn about their concerns? It was an amazing uh, conference uh, that was sponsored by the Strong Cities Global Summit. It was Strong Cities Global Network. And essentially it was 200 global leaders from everywhere from Kenya, Baghdad, and Oslo, Norway, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, mayors and governors who were there to pledge their support to the group to share resources and best practices to counter violent extremism. As you toured Europe, as you spent time in, uh, in those locations anyway, what did you learn about what was fueling support for the far right in Europe? It's mostly socioeconomic conditions. Uh, in places like Greece, uh, with austerity measures, uh, people just don't have the same opportunities that they used to have. And with the refugee crisis, they feel like that more is gonna be taken away from them. So I think when people have a lack of opportunity and are facing socioeconomic conditions that are desperate, they tend to search for answers that aren't always based in logic. Was there something you learned that uh, was new or especially surprising? Well, what's happening is that these uh, far-right extremists who are be being elected to parliament and to government are uh, learning to tone down their rhetoric from their open neo-Nazi days when they would proudly profess that they hated people. Now they've changed their message to be more helpful of the community that's being, that they say is being destroyed by refugees and immigrants. So they actually go to areas that are affected by the refugee crisis and talk to uh, the people who live there, not the refugees, but the, but the people from mm -hmm. that country, and they claim that they're there to protect them from the crime uh, that the refugees are bringing, which is unfounded. So it sounds like what they're doing is they're mainstreaming their message, the, the, the language and the, and the tone. That's actually something that, that we taught when I was in the movement is that we saw that if we led with hate that it turned people away. So they've learned uh, through very savvy marketing to tone down their rhetoric and appeal to kind of the reptile brain of people, their flight or fight or flight instinct. Uh, and when they're facing desperate measures, they promise paradise to them uh, and always 
point the blame at somebody else. It's never their fault for the choices that they've made, that they may be experiencing this. It's never the government's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. So they're playing an us against them game. You know, we've heard of, uh, of right-wing extremist groups in, uh, in Europe for some time, uh, uh, Le Pen in France and uh, movements in the UK. Sure. But uh, th there is a definite sense, or is there actual empirical evidence that the far right-wing extremist groups are growing in number? They're absolutely growing in number. Uh, in the United States, we saw a dramatic rise in, in people joining hate groups when President Obama was elected because they feared that a black president may destroy uh, white culture in this country. And across Europe, uh, in countries like Austria, where Hofer lost by just 30,000 votes to become the president, and in Slovakia, where they're actually winning parliament seats, and, and, and in Greece, where organizations like Golden Dawn, which are openly neo-Nazi groups, have won several seats in parliament. So it's definitely growing, and it's starting to, to get traction, unfortunately. What reaction do you, uh, did you pick up on how, quote, mainstream uh, politicians were were uh, were reacting, how they were reacting to to the rise. Say, for example, of, to the election of that member in parliament. You know, from my experience in Slovakia, there weren't a lot of politicians that tried to expose this person's path past who was a neo-Nazi who was elected. Uh, it seems here in the United States, we tend to politicians tend to be able to point the finger at each other and, and argue a little bit more than they do in Europe. But uh, it doesn't seem like they're really bringing out that facet of the story as much as they are trying to promote their own agenda. So established politicians are not necessarily calling out politicians who, who are espousing, um, even in a mainstream kind of a way, uh, far-right extremist uh, rhetoric. Um, in, in terms of um, in terms of here in the United States, what is known about the rise of right-wing extremism, numbers and that sort of thing? So when uh, President Bill Clinton was elected, uh, I believe it was the Southern Poverty Law Center that said there were around 1,400 hate groups in the United States at the time. Uh, when, Governor, or when President Bush was elected, uh, the number actually went down. But when President Obama was elected, the number skyrocketed and went to over 4,000 hate groups. Uh, and I think people were scared. Uh, you know, hatred is based on fear and ignorance and, and, and isolation. Uh, and I think what politicians are doing in this country now are going back to this ultra-nationalist. They're hiding their racism behind patriotism. Christian Picciolini, when you were overseas, what did people want to know about you? They wanted to know my story, what my motivations were that attracted me to the group uh, and what life was like in the group and also what my motivations were to leave because I think most people don't really understand that it's easy for a normal kid who comes from a good family uh, to really go down that path. Uh, we see it in young girls from middle America who are flying to Syria to try and join ISIS. Uh, we see it in, in the inner cities of Chicago where young people are joining gangs and it really boils down to a lack of opportunity. If we, if we can't provide the right opportunities to those who need them the most, they will never have the same access of, as those of privilege. And we're always going to see those folks turn more towards extremist ideologies. Last question, and that is, what questions did they have about this country? Why Trump? That was the number one question that I got. Is he going to get elected? What's going to happen in November? And I, six months ago, I could have told him that I didn't think it would ever be a possibility. And now I can tell him that I have no idea what's going to happen. Christian Picciolini, thank you so much for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you, Phil. Jay Shevsky profiled Mr. Picciolini in a story, and you can watch that video on our website.